and welcome back to Biohacking Superhuman Performance. I'm Natalie Nidham, and once again, I'm very happy and lucky to be here with Jean-Francois Tremblay from CanLab. Jean-Francois, welcome. Thank you. Um, so today, Jean-Francois and I have committed to do a short, hard-hitting, dense episode. We're only going to talk about one peptide, um, and it's a peptide that a lot of people don't know that much about, and it's actually a really interesting peptide. I mean, not that there is a peptide made that's not really interesting, but this one's very cool. I just had the uh, opportunity to dig, to dig into it a little bit today, getting prepared for this. Um, and then we're going to ask, a, we're going to answer a couple of, uh, or address a couple of issues that have come up. Uh, quite a lot in the Facebook group, the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Group. Um, these are things that they're not necessarily related to thymulin, but I think what we'll do in our upcoming podcast is we're going to keep them a little bit more focused like this, and we'll always answer or speak to a couple of issues that we see that keep popping up. So hopefully that'll be helpful to people. Deal? Yeah. Great. All right. So Jean-Francois and I were talking last week, and I came across a peptide on the CanLab site called Thymulin that I didn't know a whole lot about. So of course, I send a note to my trusty Jean-Francois and say, hey, what's up with this Thymulin stuff? So he sends me a bunch of studies. I dig into it. And of course, as per usual, super, um, super interesting. So Thymulin, I'll just, I'll just introduce it quickly, is one of the thymus peptides, it's an immune modulating peptide, um, and it is really dependent on zinc for its function. So, um, which is really interesting because of course, so many people are deficient in zinc and we know that zinc is so critical to immune function. And now we start to see why, right? Because zinc acts as a cofactor for this peptide, which as I was reading the study, Jean-Francois, thymulin will bind to the receptor even in the absence of zinc, but it won't do anything. So or, or much, much less. Or exactly, or much less. And uh, actually, and that was asked uh, in the groups and other groups, uh, okay, so uh, what happened, you know, if you inject only thymulin? Well, the, the thing is, uh, thymulin being one of the native peptides from the thymus, uh, when it is secreted by the thymus, it is secreted without zinc. Yeah. And like with the GHK, once it's, it reaches the bloodstream, then it's a passive thing. You know, you don't need to force that reaction. It just happened in the presence. So uh, it's just going to bind to zinc that it, floating around the blood right. uh, and bang it's gonna become thymelin with zinc but it needs to find the zinc <laughs> uh, yeah that's the thing uh, assuming that you have enough zinc that so that you're not deficient and you know so maybe for people that are not sure or for whatever reason maybe at that moment like maybe uh 20 minutes before taking a shot. And same thing with GHK. Uh, take a supplement of zinc. And, and we know that the better ones come with copper. Exactly. In uh, that to balance out. Right. So yeah. the same supplement yeah. could be used for both uh, GHK and Timulant. Yeah. So at least even if you're deficient, but you take it 20 minutes before, then chances are you will have a high blood level of zinc. So the, the, the peptide will have some around to bind to. And, uh, and, uh, but you know, if you're not sure of your status on zinc, it's a good idea to have it tested. Right, so the, thing, so the, so the interesting thing about zinc and copper, I think that is, bears mentioning, is that your genetics come into play here as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, this is where it's a really good idea, if you've looked at your genomic report, to understand if you're a person that has a tendency to bioaccumulate zinc, Mm -hmm. and copper and those people actually need to be careful with not supplementing because they can build toxic levels quite quickly so with zinc there's some i think there's some symptoms when you're over when you're overdone on zinc um you uh, i think nausea is one of them you know you feel a bit sick copper uh, and, and it takes a, the t but isn't the loss of taste and smell a lack of zinc or is it excess of zinc 
Uh, I know that if you have too much zinc, uh, you have a metal taste in your and mouth. That start, a, a bit like metformin for other reasons. So you get that. Uh, but truth is, it's because uh, of, I don't know if we talked about that before, because of the depletion of cells and all that, most populations on this planet are zinc deficient, mm -hmm. which in big part explains the... Uh, every decade, we see a lowering of uh, testosterone levels in men. Right. Because it's, so it's, it's directly uh, influenced by the, 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 the zinc deficiencies uh, that we're seeing over the decades. Okay, cool. So understanding your genomics, and if you're really curious and you have access to it, um, there's definitely tests like a spectra cell that can assess mm. your status of zinc and copper. But failing that, if you're going to use one of these peptides, as you're saying, the mm. GHK or something like a thymulin, then at least for the duration of the time that you're using those peptides, supplementing even right. to a low dose of these, yeah. like you don't need a lot, right? Like no, it's a pretty low dose, it's gonna, you're going to cover off your bases. Um, but it's so, but to me, it was so fascinating. It was kind of like one of those, oh, that's why zinc is so impre incredibly important. With the immune, immune system. system. That's um, right. It's, it's pretty fascinating. So things that people should know about thymulin. Well, is, not only for that. It's good. Like when okay. we and saw that. with the, those yeah. uh, transporter, the zinc itself and within the cell binds to the corona, that's in Spanish, you know, the, the crowns of the virus, so to yeah. say, to inactivate yeah. them. So, you know, it's, it's uh, many activities, but uh, a lot to do with immunity, yes. Well, you know, it's funny, these days when I go into a grocery store, and I mean, I'm sure this is silly, but I will always take a zinc lozenge yeah. and put it in and, and let it dissolve in my mouth while I'm grocery shopping, because that zinc kind of floating around, it will bind to... You know, one of the reasons why we take <clears throat> lozenges for colds is they yeah. can to the viruses that we're exposed to, not exactly. necessarily COVID-19. And like I said, I'm sure this isn't, this is, this will never be a protocol for grocery shopping. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, 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 I know we will talk about it a bit later, but you have that, uh... What your ecological effect, of course, it does yeah. make a difference. Sure. Anyway, so one of the things that's really important and that we're really interesting that came up as well is that thymulin, like so many other things in the human body, just we drop off the cliff. After the age of 60, our, our endogenous production of thymulin will totally drop. And so um, some of the things that, so, so it's an interesting peptide. Maybe you can talk about this a little bit in that, we, it's considered to be immune modulating in the sense that it'll affect the, the T suppressor cells and the T helper cells. And that, which one it does, seems to be somewhat dose dependent. At, to some degree. Me, I see it as, uh, I see the uh, immune modulation effect a bit like with thymosin alpha-1, except that if you need to uh, increase the uh, uh, T cells activity, it seems that it needs less thymulin than if you have an autoimmune uh, condition where you would need a stronger effect. Yeah, so it's, it's, still a, yeah. it's still a modulation effect. But uh, it seems that on one side, it's easier to balance than, you know, TH1 uh, and TH2, than to balance the, the other side. So right. that, yeah. that, I believe, is, is what's happening. So yes, it is. Uh, it's the same mechanism, but they're a bit uh, dose dependent in that case. Right. So yeah, because it was talking about, in, the, in, the, in any event, in the paper I, I looked at, which I can always post in the comments yeah, when yeah. I post this, um, that um, in the kind of 50 to 500 microgram dosages is what they were seeming to use for, um, for immune support. Whereas in the one milligram, like one to 10 milligrams, it's actually a really big range. They, they were quite undecided on that one, but that's where they were seeing more benefit for people with autoimmune issues. 
Um, That's why I wouldn't say that it's uh, immune suppressant per se. No, it's it's immune modulating for. And and uh, we discussed that before. Uh, peptides are intelligent in that way. As I said, they're not intelligent like you know you are not going to play chess with them, but they're intelligent in the sense that they're very selective in their actions and they will have you know you read about uh okay bpc157 it does this 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 and you have a long list mm -hmm. but it's not gonna do everything every time it's gonna you know through the signaling of factors that are locally secreted then this action will start to happen so it's going to be very selective uh, uh, and I, I want to attend that the angiogenesis because some people are afraid yeah. in case of cancers or suspicion of cancer that if they take bpc157 for example they will increase angiogenesis which could make the cancer worse well the point is no because if you have a cancer you don't need angiogenesis well the cancer is already driving it there you go so it, it won't happen as if you have an injury let's say you break a ligament and you do need more blood flow to that area to heal then yes, angiogenesis will be produced. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's basically, you get the effect you need when and where you need it. Not all, it's not like a drug where it forces its effect. Right. It's, it's, it's like you get a, a compound, a peptide that has the potential to have all those effects, mm -hmm. but those effects, particular ones, will manifest where they're needed and won't where they're not needed. Basically, that's what we see. And that's one of the magic, so to say, of uh, peptides. Well, it is in a way, and it actually, that's a really good way of articulating how peptides are different from drugs. Exactly. And the drug has a very defined, you know, it's like on a mission. My job is to do this. And, 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 they, it force, right and they force yeah. that action. There is no way around it. Where the peptide might be more flexible in that sense and mm -hmm. have, and in, and in many ways, maybe it's not the peptide that is intelligent, but it's the body. Is well, it's, it's the it? whole uh, well, no, thing. No, no, it's, it's yes. just that the body uses, it's the body's innate intelligence that's going to tap into the peptide in a different way. Well, pep it's kind of, it goes hand in hand because yeah, peptides yeah. are produced by the well, exactly. body itself. So, you know, it knows how to respond to, so, yeah. Yeah, they know each other. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> so, so some of the conditions that um, certainly even, and there have been clinical studies done, I mean, obviously lots on mice, but there have been clinical studies done on humans and there have been some, there's been some promise seen from things like DeGeorge syndrome, which is a genetic condition that small children are, that children are born with. And part of that syndrome is total immunosuppression. And in those cases, they've seen this particular peptide actually be very helpful with those kids. Um, and then on the other side of the scale, you've got things like rheumatoid arthritis, where now you're trying to bring down the system, like, you know, modulate this, the mm -hmm. immune system in another direction. Again, in, um, in humans, like they used it up to, for up to six months. And I think it was five milligrams a day that they were, a day or every other day. Um, well, up, no, up to 10 milligrams a day. Yeah, but anyway, one of the studies said it was, yeah. but, but, but it helped them with their pain, with their stiffness, with their quality of life. What was really interesting though is it didn't actually change their blood work much like the no. ra um the, the rheumatoid arthritis markers are still there the inflammatory markers were still there but the individuals felt better and functioned better so i'm sure i mean you know maybe there's still other stuff going on in the symptom in the system but definitely from in terms of how these people were able to feel and function it made a huge impact for them yep um Oh, and other ones are lupus, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that these are other autoimmune uh, diseases, and um, and what else? Oh, yeah, type one diabetes. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? 
Well, it seems, yeah, somehow it seems to uh, participate to the repair of those uh, pancreas cells. Yeah. That, uh, well, from where the, their deficiency in either absence or decrease or whatever uh, produce uh, type one diabetes, they seem to participate in that uh, repair. Uh, and, and, you know, it is possible, you know, it has been shown with uh, like one of the bioregulator uh, pancreagen yeah. to regenerate those cells. So it's uh, the, the body when given the right compounds can do it. Yeah. Certainly when it's autoimmune, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the uh, study more more read, so. Yeah. The study that I read talked about it, when they, when they had success with it, they first, it was in phase two of uh, the type 1 diabetes, which means that they'd already used immunosuppressive drugs in, in some ways almost to stop the cascade. Mm -hmm. And then they bring in the thymulin and it somehow helps to regenerate those, those is well, it the beta islet cells that mm -hmm. use insulin? Well, uh, by, by suppressing first the immune system, then they showed that, yeah, there is a uh, a relation with the immune system, obviously. Obviously, yeah. And 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 yeah, by introducing the timulin, which is a balance balancing of the immune system. Now there was a strong unbalance, so the timulin brought it back again, like a bit uh, like time as an alpha one, but just brought it back where it should be, no more, no less. So it was kind to reset the immune system to where it uh, should be. Mm -hmm. So if the cause of the problem was, yeah, autoimmune, then that's, that would be the way to fix it. A bit like if you have, uh, uh, how do you call it, um, the, this biosis and you're, yeah. uh, uh, even the, the, the most uh, uh, medical, the most uh, anti-medicine doctors in functional medicine will use antibiotics. Absolutely. And, yeah. Pro, you kill everything, then repopulate with good ones. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes you just need to do that, you know, start from scratch and then rebuild the right way. Yeah, well, it's like when you have an old, when you have a house that's too old and it's just, it's, sometimes it's just better to tear the thing down there and you start go. over again. Um, what else did we, we want to talk about this? Um, well, uh, you know what? there was something else. Thymosin alpha-1 and thymulin, it sounds to me... Like they're, they're not that different. Do you know how they are? Like, why? I, I, you actually, know? Uh, you know, I've read and I wish I could, I'll try to find where I've read that. But uh, in, in China, when they had that uh, outbreak of uh, COVID-19, uh, it was reported that in the hospital, they were treating uh, patients with uh, timulin. Right, because it affects this. The, yeah, so there was a study I saw where it said, again, it modulates that cytokine storm. There you go. And specifically in the lungs. Yeah. Which, well, actually, it was because I guess they had... Well, not there. Yeah, the, yeah. They, they the see the effect, but it seems it's more an effect on the blood vessels that yeah. manifests itself in, in the lung. Anyway, it's a bit more complex, but yeah, basically this is it. Well, so, uh, no, the key, uh, if we talk about that virus pandemia right now is yeah it's the immune system there is no no big secret around it well and modulating uh, it so that it doesn't go into overdrive somehow if you catch it and it may go or to if your immune you make your immune system strong in the sense that just where it should be yeah then if you catch it it won't go further than that Mm -hmm. Just like uh, yeah. mild symptoms, and that that will be it. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, for me right now, like you, I think. I mean, I'm using my thymosin alpha one pretty consistently. I'm mm. taking zinc periodically. Like I don't take mm. it every day, but I probably yeah. take some every week. Um, and um, I'm, you know, optimizing my D3 and K2 because, again, the other thing. I mean, it's could. We don't want this to turn into a COVID nineteen discussion, but there's definitely graphs. You actually posted a really good one in the group last week uh -huh. that showed that not that people have to supplement with D3 if they get sick, but you have to make sure you have to want to make sure that your D3 levels are optimal 
because it right. seems to have a huge impact on people's outcome if they catch COVID. If they get sick, yeah. yeah. Once you're sick, it may not be the best time to start. To start, thinking. exactly. So making, you know, so it's kind of like taking care of the house right now. Before anything happens, balance the immune system, optimize those cofactors that your immune system needs to function properly. That, that's the whole point. That's why people get sick of anything. That because word well, we're, we became weaker and weaker. And imbalanced. For, for yeah. contamination, the stress, uh, the, the, the uh, food is less nutritive than before. Uh, so, of course, we see all those things happening. You know, uh, we talked about that. Uh, the, the, the Lyme disease, it's not a new thing. Uh, they, they found Lyme uh, bacteria, dead ones, but in mummies, 5,000 years old. So it's not new. Maybe the variants are okay, but no, what is new is we're, we're weaker and uh, uh, those things show up. Yeah. So take care of the house, be healthy, and you're going to avoid most most of those things. And even if you catch them, you'll avoid uh, strong symptoms, basically. Yeah, so that's, that's the thing, right? It's not going to prevent you from catching something, but it may very well set you up for a much better outcome. Because oh, and by the way, Tell me. Uh, the old solution to that thing, it's not complicated. They couldn't apply it at the beginning because we were not ready, but it's, it's going to come down to one, two things. Oh, Wash yeah. your hands and wear a mask. That, yeah. That's the end of it. If you wear a mask and I wear a mask and one of us has the virus, there's still, there is 1.5% chance that you'll contract it from me. If you wear a mask and I wear one. Well, and if we're very close and yelling at each other. And you know, like you're, um, that's, that's <laughs> that 1.5%. Yeah. So it's not complicated. You could, they could stop the confinement. They could, if they would, everybody would wear a mask. It's cheap. It's easy. You know, before we would watch, you know, on the news, those little Chinese people all wear a mask all the time. So they're crazy. Well, no, they were not that crazy. That's what <laughs> we should do now. <laughs> no, they're kind of onto something, actually. And instead of forced confinement, which is really harsh on the economy, I'm sure everybody will ag agree, just, yeah, that could be implanted, you know, confined or wear masks you know you decide some people they, they like to be confined you know they get a little check from the government and no no there are some of them uh, <laughs> and watch netflix all day me I, I i've been watching a lot of netflix i cannot tell you the number of lives i've saved like that uh, <laughs> anyway but that that's it's that simple we were not ready because there wasn't that many masks a yeah. month or so ago but now that's being fixed and the, that, that problem could be fixed uh, very fast even in the case of because that virus will mutate they found mutation already one of them is worse yeah and what we see with a higher rate uh, in the south of the u.s i think they popped out and somewhere else yeah. another variant popped out it's less even less symptomatic, less problem. We don't know in six months what's going to pop out. But wear masks. That's it. And optimize your immune and balance your immune and, system. Yeah, on um, yeah. If that is taken well, care of, wash your hands, optimize your immune system, and and you know. Yeah. And so, in that sense, I mean, even though now there's this weird thing coming up with kids, uh, with some children, in that sense it makes so much sense that it's hitting an older population much harder. Yeah, but- Our immune function goes down. Our growth hormone secretion goes, like everything depletes and- but you're, you're surprised with kids. Listen, 20 years ago, diabetes type two was known to be an old people problem. Yeah. Now you have children who have type two diabetes. Yeah. They're affected by bad, habits of yeah. diet everything yeah i think we so, don't know enough yet because i don't i you know i mean i think we don't this is so new we do, what i read this morning was that they had no underlying conditions but the problem is the conventional 
you know, conventional medicine often doesn't consider things that we consider imbalances to be imbalances. Like they're not going to look at a child's zinc status or a child's, you know, whatever it happens or if a kid's sleep deprived. So we don't, we just don't know yet. And, and I mean, you know, and, it, and, and they just sometimes don't make that one plus one makes two. Like they know, you know, those, uh, that medication, the chloro. Kin hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, that, you know, what it does with zinc. And that's yeah. why the results are mitigated because some people, they will try on them, have low zinc. So, you know, it's not going to work so well. So they're going to say, oh, yeah, it doesn't work for everybody. It's not that good. <laughs> yeah, but did you think that to work, you need zinc? And maybe those people you gave it to, they didn't have enough zinc. They were deficient, yeah. Uh, you know, they should have thought about that. But for some, I don't know why they don't think about that. But anyway. Anyway, it's all good. So, so Timberland, basically, that's it. And uh, I know that the big question is dosages. Mm -hmm. Well, it's easy. No, it's, well, easy. It's not easy. But, no, but as an overall preventive uh, strengthening of the immune system. Yeah. I would go between half a milligram to one milligram per day. And basically I would do that by, if you're a, a, a man kind of, you know, maybe a hundred, around 180 pounds, mm -hmm. uh, one milligrams. If you're a tiny woman, 115 pounds, than half a milligram. Yeah. Basically, that's so to be very general, I would go one milligram for men and half a milligram for women. And the same thing preventively, while well, in that particular case right now of the, the virus, I, I would do it more than a, a, a general preventive approach, which would be maybe do six weeks twice a year or three weeks four times a year. Uh, in that case, you can do that uh, three to six weeks at that dosage and then continue with the maintenance of that preventive dose. So maybe for a man who would take one milligram a day for, I would go for a month in that case right now in view of the virus, maybe do mm -hmm. one month at one, one milligram a day. Yeah. And after that, maybe one milligram once or twice a week. Because now your, your immune system should be where it should be. And, you know, if it drifts a bit up or down, that well, you bring, you know, you bring it back with one or two shots a week. So would you cycle it with, with thym thymosin alpha-1 then? Because they're, they're very similar. Right. Uh, it's yeah. I, I would do either one. So it's one or the other because they're both yeah. manipulating. Exactly. Basically, okay. uh, I, I don't. Uh, we talked about that. You, uh, same thing with SARMs. You know, people. Uh, that's when we talked about SARMs. Should I use? Uh, some people they ask, can I use this SARM with this SARM? I say no. All you do is increasing the dose of the same category of compounds. So if you exactly. use both, you'll get the same effect, but it would be the same if uh, you would double the dose of thymosin alpha-1 mm -hmm. if you were taking it alone or doubling timulin. Yeah. You know, but uh, you won't have a one plus one. No, well, no, I was thinking more that you might do uh, thymulin once and then the next one you might do thymosin alpha-1 then the next, you know, like you might do. You yeah, you can do that because, because uh, there is a reason when it's not therapeutic, where yeah. my point of view is you do for as long as you need until you're healed, basically. Uh, I like to cycle everything. Uh, why too? Because, you know, uh, we do develop antibodies to peptides. I know. Uh, but most of the times, those antibodies are inactive. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, they, you get active antibodies for bigger peptides, you know, because the body sees them bigger, they recognize them more as a threat or could yeah. be threat. But most of the time, it's inactive, but the, 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 the possibility is always there. So by cycling, then you, you kind of avoid that possibility. That's possibility. Overuse okay, cool. of the peptide. Uh, not therapeutically. 
Okay. So the last two things we were going to talk about today, one has nothing to do um, with this. And, and this is just something that comes up in the group quite often. And I know that you have some experience in this area. And for me, I have a very stock answer to these questions. Quite often we have guys asking about or talking about how they think they need to be taking aromatase inhibitors. And what aromatase inhibitors are, are basically they're, they're drugs that prevent testosterone from converting into estrogen. And I think that a lot of people don't really grasp how important estrogen is to men as well as to women. Um, and I think that to blindly decide you're going to take an aromatase inhibitor without understanding, first of all, what your status is, your hormone status is today. So whether you're doing a Dutch panel or blood testing to really see what's going on. And even to a degree, having done your genetic testing would help you to understand, are, are your pathways for aromatization upregulated or downregulated? Because sometimes that you can address it at that point. But I know that you had a really strong point of view on aromatase inhibitors in general, so. Yeah, that goes back over 30 years ago. <laughs> when I was doing other kinds of consultations. Yeah. And, and basically, it's easy. You aromatize testosterone when you have too much. Or you over aromatize when you have too much testosterone. So now you're, you're going to tell me, okay, I do it. Uh, okay, in the case of a bodybuilder who takes a thousand milligrams a week of testosterone, yeah, well, yeah. That, that's too much. Yeah. So then they're the first, again, who started to use aromatase inhibitors. So now you come to people, they say, yeah, no, but I'm not taking a thousand milligrams a week. I'm doing TRT. I'm taking replacement. So I'm not overdosing. Well, you're wrong. You are. Yeah. You don't know it, but you are because you're doing it wrong most of the time. And most doctors prescribe it wrong is that the pharmacokinetic of injected testosterone, it's not a straight line up, meaning you inject it and then you reach right away one level and keep that level for let's say two weeks and then it drops where you take another shot. It's a curve. Yeah. So the day you inject, you have a much higher level of testosterone than the natural levels. And because of that, you will aromatize. And then it's going to drop. But that all aromatization process, it's, it started. So even after it drops, you will continue to aromatize until the body realizes, oh, but I don't have too much testosterone anymore. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to stop. Then uh, 10 days or a week or two weeks after, we're going to take another shot. And bang, you're going to start that again. And first thing you know, you have bitched it. <laughs> and, and you wonder why. So the problem is not with the actual aromatization. And actually now the, 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 the school of thought is you don't need. It's because if you take too much uh, inhibitors, then you will lower too much estrogen. Mm -hmm. and first thing you'll know, you'll have joint pain all over. Huh. Because you don't have enough for men. If you, that, that was one of the first symptoms. You have pain everywhere in the joints. So the solution to that is, it's uh, it's only to do to do it right. So people they do use the cream where yeah. it's, it's a daily it's dose, yeah. so they have much more steady levels. Yeah. People who inject testosterone in smaller quantities, but more frequently and mm -hmm. uh, as a minimum twice a week, they don't have that problem. Okay. Or there is one form of injectable testosterone that it's high life. It's 33.34 days. It's amazingly stable. Hmm. And you take a shot like every month and you're okay. You don't aromatize. It's testosterone on the canoate. Uh, it's, I don't remember the commercial names. There, there is one name for Europe, one name for America, but... Uh, it is sold in pharmacies and you, ha you have much more steady levels because basically there is a ratio to keep. And if you increase your testosterone, 
there should be an, uh, some aromatization that happen. You should have a ratio, uh, the estrogen should increase a bit. Right. Be so they have it, to exist in a certain ratio. Exactly. So yeah. if you have a steady release, no big peak, no big drops in testosterone, meaning if you do it right, there is no need. In most cases, there is always exception. You know, like I know, but me, well, yeah, there, there are some exceptions. But in 90% plus of cases, if you do it right, there is no need and it actually could be counterproductive to it, to use uh, anti-aromatase. Yeah. Well, and I think hormone, the whole area of hormone optimization if you're not measuring and looking to see what is actually happening, you're, you're, you're dancing with trouble. Like you're just, you're looking for trouble. At the end of the day, you can't just, um, you can't just keep throwing stuff at your body, hoping that you're getting it right. Um, anyway, that's certainly my point of view. And then yeah, the yeah. last thing we were going to touch on very briefly, because our short, our short yeah. episode is getting very long. All we're, we're trying, we're trying. <laughs> Um, so the last thing we're going to talk about is very often we have people um, who will come on and ask about unexpected side effects of peptides. So for, for starters, I think that we have to really, really honor everybody's bioindividuality. Like at the end of the day, as much as we can say that this is what you can expect from whatever peptide, whatever supplement, medication, whatever it may be, there's a certain degree of your body is your unique, your condition, your state of um, health, your whatever, any number of variables can affect how that thing affects you. But one of the things we were talking about, and, and especially I think it comes with, with these biohacking compounds that people are really excited to try. They're very, they're anticipating big things. They don't know what to expect. They're a little bit afraid sometimes. And so you're, you kind of work yourself up into this state and then you notice, oh my God, I don't know, my hair's falling out or I, I have a rash or whatever the case or may be. Or high blood pressure or this high or High blood that. pressure or, yeah, so. I, I've seen that so many times. Uh, I gave you an example before of uh, line, I won't go into details, but this kid, I remember, he was so nervous about taking, starting a therapy. Uh, long story short, he, he took one pill and he passed out. And let me tell you what he was taking, I didn't have as a side effect passing out. But he, he was so nervous about the whole thing. Uh, so you get that your mind, uh, like in the placebo effect, your mind can have a very strong positive effect. Yeah. But if somehow you're minded on something may go bad or you're too nervous about things, think about all those people, you know, for insurance purposes, they go see the doctor, they take their blood pressure at home. Yeah. Blood pressure is normal. They're, they're in the doctor's office, high blood pressure. Yeah, it's called white coat syndrome. You know that, and, and you know, a lot of people believe that in the power of the mind and what it can do and they meditate and, but suddenly you tell them, yeah, but the, what you think can actually do more than that. It can have physical positive or negative manifestations and <laughs> somehow they're not ready to go that extra step uh, mm -hmm. agreeing to that but it does happen all the time again the placebo effect is the best example yeah so uh, you cannot deny it and and yeah some people sometimes they get side effects that you would never expect and it's not actually due to the compound they're taking but to their uh, mind frame of mm -hmm. taking it you know they're so nervous maybe it's the first time ever they inject something uh, they, they are not well educated on the what it is, so you know it's normal. Yeah, I think so. we just we just have to allow that. There's a you know I think that I think that being calm about and being analytical about these mm. things because there is a possibility that someone could have 
an unusual response to something. That there is, you know, and, and then, you know, you have the par paradoxical effect where, you know, you get yeah. the up, but that's rare. But you, but you have to, but definitely approach but these things with curiosity, pulling back, stopping, starting again, mm. starting slower. You know, like for me with the, with the SARM, with the RAD 140, mm. it turns out the first dose and possibly because I was also using testosterone. And so mm. you had two effects cumulatively, you know, the hair started jumping mm. off my head all of a sudden. So, you know, so it was like, uh, stop everything, come back slowly. Um, and being open to the possibility that sometimes a compound might not be the right one for you. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I just think that it's important for people to to kind of see both sides of the scale a little bit. That sometimes, you know, it's when I mean when I say it's in your head, I don't mean it in a bad way. I'm actually acknowledging the power of your mind on your physiology. There you go. Um, and being being cognizant and respectful of that at the same time. That's okay, right. well, I think that we covered a lot of ground. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about, Jean-Francois, or are we good for today? I think we're good. I think we're good, too. Okay, yes. so I will, um, I will most likely, in the group, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you, can find, um, you can find me and Jean-Francois quite often on uh, Facebook at the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Group. Um, and also, Jean-Francois um, is the owner of CanLab, and you can find him at canlab.net. Um, and also with me, um, you can find me on that Facebook group. And just to highlight and to once again, just we always have to mention this, that we're not giving medical advice here, guys. If you have a medical condition, if you're going to start using a peptide, please, please, please find someone who can support you through the process, who has knowledge of this stuff. Um, always check with your medical provider. Uh, we are not uh, advocating for using peptides, nor, more importantly, are we advocating for you treating yourself with peptides. This is not about medical advice. We're giving, in, we're just really about sharing information because peptides are incredible compounds that are that have a huge potential. Um, so we think we believe strongly that people should know about them, um, but always make sure that you're getting good advice and coverage by your medical health professional. We oui? Great. All right. Thank you very much, Jean-Francois. Once again, always a pleasure. Likewise. All right.